Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Duncan Road Church. We've got a few who are under the weather. Colin's got COVID and uh, one or two of us have got coughs and sneezes and uh, various diseases. And uh, of course, we've got one or two who uh, are struggling long term with health problems. But we are here and that is good. And we're here to uh, worship the Lord together. So let's get right on and do that. And we're going to sing two songs together, Light of the World, and then in response to that, I love you, Lord. So Light of the World, we'll remain standing, and then we'll sing, I love you, Lord. Let's stand. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, awful of sin. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am, so here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Let's remain standing. The Hebrew word of the Old Testament for worship is to bow down. And the idea is we bow down, we humble ourselves, we put our will under his will. We bow down to a greater authority. Let's sing this in response to God's love for us. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Oh, my soul, 
Take joy, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Oh, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. One more time, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, hear what you hear. Oh, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Oh, may it be, oh, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Please be seated. Good, let's uh, link our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Let's uh, commit our service to the Lord. (coughs) Loving God, thank you that we can declare our love for you because you first loved us when we couldn't care about you, when we were ignorant of you. You in your goodness, in your mercy, reached out to us. And Lord, many of us can say that our eyes were opened. We had that spiritual awakening, that conversion moment, uh, a time when these things became more than just print on the page and uh, tunes in our head, when the truth of these songs became real to us. And Lord, we're grateful, we're thankful. When we discovered Christ, what a difference he has made in each and every life who has found him. And Lord, we pray even this morning, if there are those here who don't know Christ, then speak into their hearts and lives, we pray. Thank you, Lord, that we do love you. We're not embarrassed or ashamed of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And we pray, Lord, that that love will demonstrate itself this day, this week, if you spare us, Lord, in our daily living. May folks tell from our conversation, from our words, from our attitude and our actions that we belong to Christ. And it's Christ who lives in us. So we do love you. And, Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we don't want just religion. We want reality. And so we pray that uh, uh, the truth of these things will be evidence as the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of us and changes us day by day, bit by bit. Lord, thank you that we sang about bowing down and whether we do that physically or symbolically, uh, the point is the same. You are the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, You are the one who has made us. You are the one who has saved us in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. So help us respond accordingly. We know, Lord, at a human level, when people help us and do things for us, we are grateful. We are thankful. We often say, how can I repay you? And folks often say, well, no need to. But Lord, you are the God of eternity who has entered his own creation and bled on a cross. Lord, you bore the sins of humanity And you deserve, as the hymn writer said, my life, my soul, my all. So help us respond accordingly this morning. So we praise you. We thank you for health, for strength, for this new day. We are conscious of our friends, our loved ones who are unable to be with us because of the problems of long-term ill health. Again, we pray for Alistair. We think of Martin and Maureen. We pray for Sabrina. Uh, There's a list, Lord, that uh, for Rita in hospital, there's a list and no doubt... I I could add to it many more names, but Lord, we pray for them. May they be conscious of our prayers, and may they feel part of this service if they're watching online this morning. So Lord, we commit our time to you now in Jesus' name. Receive our thanksgiving, hear our petitions, and receive our worship as we bring it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to have a reading. We're in the book of Proverbs for a couple more weeks. We're going through the book of Proverbs before we move on to a different part of the Bible, and then we'll come back to Proverbs later on. Are you okay? 
Nice to see you. It's nice to open your eyes and see different faces, isn't it? It is for a preacher anyway. Proverbs chapter... And good morning, Mr. Mitchell. Don't want you to feel left out, okay? (laughs) Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1 to 9. Let's read it together. You may remain seated. I'll read a verse. You read a verse. And we'll just go through it so that we know where we're heading. My son, this is Solomon, said to be the wisest man who ever lived. As a young kid, um, when he was 12 years old, God had said, Solomon, you can have whatever you want. What would you have? You could have anything in the world. What would you have? What would you have if I could give you anything at all? What would you have? Infinite wishes. <laughs> you can't have that, I'm afraid. Solomon said, I'd like to be wise because I've just been made king. I don't know what to do. How do you become, how do you king it? And God said, because you haven't asked for selfish things, infinite wishes and money and fame, I'll give you wisdom and you'll get all those things as well. And Solomon, writing to his son, writes these words. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, so do this, my son, to three yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? How many are you going to be quoting that verse this week? <laughs> and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Wow, interesting verses. The thing with the book of Proverbs is it's never dull, is it? I hope not. I hope you find it interesting. It certainly keeps me on my toes as I'm studying it bit by bit. This is our all-age service. We like to do something for all ages, we hope, and certainly for the children who are here before they go off to explore us. And um, last week, we were thinking about pets that you had, and we thought about dogs. Dogs. This week, we're thinking about another type of pet. Ants. Ants. Okay? And... uh, The correct collective for a group of ants is called a swarm, a swarm of ants. And they reckon there are one million ants for every single person on the planet. One million ants for every single person. And the largest ants nest ever found was over 3,700 miles wide. Wow, that is pretty big. You don't want to mess with those ants, okay? So I just thought I'd give you a little education because ants are different just as people are different. So this is your ant education, okay? Uh, First of all, you may be familiar with the black ant. The black ant. The average black ant has a lifespan longer than any dog. 15 years the average black ant will live Unless you get that white powder down (laughs) or other remedies. Okay, so they're not going away quickly. They can outlive the average dog. So that's the black ant. 
You may be familiar with the carpenter ant, the carpenter. They can lift up seven times their, their own weight simply with their teeth. Imagine being able to pick up seven times your own weight with your teeth. Pretty impressive, the carpenter ant. Then, of course, we've got the fire ant, the fire ant, so called for two reasons. First, they have a reddish appearance, and second, they have a very, very painful sting. It will burn. Hands down for now. It will burn. So don't mess with the fire ant. So you may be familiar with the black ant, the carpenter ant, and the fire ant. And of course, we've also got the elephant, which is the biggest of the ant. Yeah? No. What do you mean, no? You're saying it's not part of the family? Are you sure? Yeah, it's not small, it's big, white. Yeah, it's the biggest of all the ants. (laughs) Okay, it's just a bit of silliness, weren't it? A bit of silliness. I'm glad you're on the ball. (laughs) Okay, if you are feeling hungry, ant eggs are a delicacy in the country of Mexico. The dish sounds gross, Eskimos, but it's actually very expensive. So you need a lot of money to enjoy ant eggs in Mexico. Personally, I think I'll give it a miss. But if you're ever in Mexico, that's what you want to go for. Just try it. Now, why are we told to study the ants? Three reasons. Number one, ants are not lazy. Ants are not lazy. They work, verse, I think what verse 7 says, even when they haven't got the boss watching over them. Even when mum and dad aren't around to say, have you washed up yet? Have you tidied your room yet? So even when there's no one looking after them, they get on and do the work. They are not lazy. Secondly, ants work together. Ants work together. Teamwork is why ant colonies grow so big, because they support one another. As soon as someone discovers a bit of sugar, they can message back, and suddenly there's a whole colony of ants coming out to consume whatever goodies they have found. Teamwork is important. There are no lone ants. They need one another to survive. And then the third thing, they share together. They share together. It all goes back to the colony. Whatever they get, they don't sit in the sunshine thinking, oh, I enjoy this little bit of sugar I found. No, it's taken back to the colony so that the queen and all the other ants benefit. And I guess we're told to study the ant for those three reasons. Lazy. Well, it's part of human nature. But, hey, I hope you're, I hope you've got initiative to get on and do the job without having someone supervise and watch over you. Secondly, working together. Teamwork is always important. Thirdly, sharing together is always important, especially if you've got a bag of sweets. See me afterwards and I'll help you share them. Okay, it's a good idea? Very good idea, he says. Okay, right. So we're going to study the ant a bit later, and you might be studying ants upstairs. I don't know what Kathy's got for you. You'll have to wait and see. But I know what we've got next. Caroline, can you come on up? Just mind a step there. Wherever you want. Um, so I help out for the last, uh, since 2011, at a camp in the Czech Republic where we teach English and also the Bible. Um, unfortunately, two out of my team of four volunteers from the UK have pulled out quite suddenly this year. So I am somewhat desperately asking if anyone here or anyone knows anyone that could replace them. Um, we'll see this slide again after the video. We've got a video from one of the Czech team who's um, asking for our help. Brothers and sisters in England, my name is Honza and I am the teacher of English and also one of the leaders of the Kids English Camp that takes place in our beautiful country, the Czech Republic. 
And today, why I am talking to you, why, what am I asking you, is for you to come and visit our country and help us with the ministry that we are doing here for the kids. Why? Well, Czechia is well known for many things. Most of them are not very good. We are in one particular thing among the top countries in the world. I'd say we are on the pedestal somewhere between first and third place. What it is? The number of atheists in the country. We are one of the most atheist countries in the world. There are not many evangelistic churches here in Czech Republic. Most of the believers, when they are some, are uh, mostly non-practicing believers. Well, today in this video, uh, why am I talking to you is, as I said, because I want to ask some of you to join us in our ministry here in Czech Republic. If there is one specific group of people that kind of incline to hearing the gospel and are not necessarily against it, are the young people. And I am also a youth leader in our church, uh, in the center of Czech Republic really, but now I'm talking about child ministry. Our kids English camp, which takes place here in Czechia, is from 8th to 15th of July. And the age of the kids we have here is probably somewhere around 7 years to 15 years old. In the kids English camp we have specific topic, but we also teach English. And that's why it's called kids English camp. And Caroline uh, Rachel and many other people uh, that you, you maybe know helped us in past years with this camp. This year we are in need for some more volunteers who are willing to maybe sacrifice their time to do something really meaningful. And that's working with the kids in the most atheistic country in the world. It's sad for me to say it like that, but it is true. So, is it for you? Is God calling you to help us in this? Maybe now you're thinking about it. Maybe you're saying, maybe a week isn't that much. Maybe I can maybe connect it with uh, some traveling to a new country. Yes, it has its advantages, of course. But what we need is you, your openness, your time, your native language, of course, but we really need your cooperation with us and with Rachel, uh, with Caroline. So my last challenge for you all, please don't be thinking, it's not for me, somebody else will come. Because if every one of you says that somebody will come, then nobody will come. And we really need maybe two, maybe three people who will be willing to help us. So please, if you have any questions, you can ask Caroline. She has the contact on me. So if you would like to get more insight into our work, into our ministry, into our culture, country, maybe some organiz organizational stuff, we are open. So thank you for listening to this kind of long video uh, inviting you to our country, to our Kids English Camp and I really hope I will see some of you in our place. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, as you can see, even the leaders who speak very good English do need a bit of help with pronunciation because it's atheist and that's what he was trying to say. Um, and I know it's short notice, but if anybody does think they can help out, um, the cost of the flights is covered by um, crowdfunding. So if anyone would like to donate financially, that's the list at the bottom. I'm going to send um, an email to Iris with all the details. 
Um, but if you are concerned, then, then the cost of flights is covered. The cost of camp, they never let us pay because um, in the Czech culture as hosts, the guests aren't allowed to, to contribute to anything or pay for anything. Um, so the only cost would be if you fancy staying in Prague for a few nights with us afterwards and exploring, then it would be the cost of the hotel, but that would be it. Um, I've probably forgotten something because I'm not great at standing in front of a group of adults. My mind goes blank. Um, Let me just have a couple of questions. Yep. When you fly out yes. and you arrive on the camp, what do they want you to do? What's an average day? So, so what would somebody do? Yep, the average day is um, we teach English in the mornings. Um, Honza teaches the youngest group because a lot of them don't speak English so very when you, well. So do you have a textbook that you go through? How do no, you we, he, so he, he and I both plan lessons um, and then the volunteers that come with us will be acting kind of as TAs, so we'll tell you what to do, just having conversations with the kids or helping some of the kids with writing stuff down, okay. um, whatever you needed, and then... It's lunchtime, then we just kind of play some board games with them for an hour or so in the afternoon, then go out and do sports, which you don't have to join in with. I don't. Um, not anymore. I did when I was in 2011, but not these days. Um, and then in the evening, um, it's uh, Bible study time. So um, because a lot of the kids don't know anything about the gospel, it's, it's very introductory. Um, it's usually by the Czech leaders, if any of the English leaders want to, to do a session, they're absolutely fine with that. They'll tr the leaders will translate for that. Um, but also, if you don't want to, if you don't feel confident, don't feel like you're going to be forced to. Brilliant. So you're not in the deep end, you're in the shallow end, no. and you can weigh that as much yeah. as you want. Fantastic. Let me uh, invite you back to your chair, and then we'll just pray for you. Do be careful of the step there. Dave, would you pray for Caroline and the work? I'll put you on the spot because you're coming back up anyway to uh, lead us in two songs. So let's just pray for the work there in the Czech Republic. Oh, it's up there as well, look. <laughs> Father, we do thank you for the opportunity um, to, to be able to work for, for Caroline and, her, and, her, and the team out there in the Czech Republic. As we've heard, it's a country where there is, there is little belief in you uh, and so that creates a great opportunity uh, to, uh, to share the gospel with those young people. And thank you that they're keen to come along. They're keen to improve their English. And I pray that will be a great opportunity for them also uh, to hear about you and your love for them. I pray that it will be a transformative time for them. Lord, you know that there is this need for two or three people to join the team. And so I pray that you would raise up those people so that this team would be full uh, and these opportunities um, taken uh, while, they, while they still exist. So they'll just raise up those people, be at work, uh, both here and over in the Czech Republic, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I don't know if I've ever been on a mission, especially abroad, where I haven't been nervous about going and sometimes not looking forward to it, but it's always blessed me as much as hopefully I've blessed them. It's, uh, you come back really enriched spiritually, and uh, emotionally as well. So let me encourage you, if you know someone, or you can go yourself to think about it. Let's, uh, musicians, come back up. Let's worship the Lord again, and then little ones will go to explorers, and we'll study the ant, amongst other things. We're going to sing to Everyone Needs Compassion, and then, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shall we stand? Oh, everyone needs compassion, a card that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Oh, everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Oh, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, oh Jesus conquered the grave. 
So take me as you find me, with all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Oh, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen. King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Savior. Oh, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory blaze spirit blaze oh set her hearts on fire flow river flow oh, flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth Lord, and let there be light. Oh Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows and to your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Every try me consume all my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Oh, set our hearts on fire. and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light as we gaze on your kingly brightness so our faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory Glory, mirrored here, may our lives tell the story. Shine on me, shine on me. Oh, 
shine, Jesus shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, place, Spirit, place, set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy, send forth Please be seated. Okay, explorers, you're going upstairs to explore. We'll see you later. Good, let's pray for them, let's pray for ourselves. Lord, as we come to your word, we ask, uh, Lord, your word will bring light, illumination to our minds and uh, shed light in our hearts and our lives as well. So bless Kathy and those upstairs, help us now to understand and to apply your word to our situation. For we ask it in Jesus' name, Amen. Loans, laziness. And the Lord's heart is how I would perhaps retitle our passage this morning. Loans, laziness, and the Lord's heart. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. A parent's advice to their child. I was listening to Roger Moore's biography or one of his books this week. And although the language is a bit fruity in places, um, it's full of just anecdotes from the actor's life. And he says, uh, on one occasion, Leonard Rossiter who played Rigsby in Rising Damp, and Reggie Perrin, a um, very well-known British actor from the past, was playing, Reggie, was, sorry, was playing Rigsby on the television. And he had to go for a, a doctor's, a medical examination. So the doctor said, well, take your shirt and vest off, strip down to the waist, and he examined him. And then he said, uh, Rigsby put his clothes back on and went home. And uh, instantly there was a phone call to the BBC. It was uh, Leonard Rossiter's mum. I must speak to him this very moment. It's urgent. It's important. And so um, they got through to Leonard Rossiter. And when he picked up the phone, he said, his mum said to him, Leonard, you didn't put your vest on. <laughs> and isn't that a mum's advice to a son, no matter how old you get in life? She was the only one, perhaps, in the whole country who realised when he redressed, he left his vest off, just put his shirt on. She didn't want him to catch cold. And here in Proverbs chapter 6, we haven't got a mother's advice, but a father's advice to his son. That reminds me of the story of the father and son who went fishing one day. And they're out in the boat, and the boy suddenly says, uh, Dad, he says, uh, how, how does this boat float on the water? And the dad thought about it. He said, well, I'm not pretty sure how that works, son. Okay, Dad. And they said, Dad, he said, how do fish breathe when they're under the water? And the dad said, well, that's a good question, but uh, I'm not quite sure how fish manage to breathe when they're under the water. So then the boy looked up and he said, Dad, he said, why is the sky blue? And his dad said, well, I'm not quite sure why we have a blue sky. And then realising he was starting to annoy his dad, he said, Dad, am I annoying you with these questions? And the dad said, no, if you don't ask questions, how are you going to learn? Well, Solomon's not asking questions, or the son's not asking questions of Solomon. Solomon's giving the answers to the questions he's not answering. And this section of Proverbs chapter 6 may seem out of place compared to last week, and some of the topics we'll cover in the next week or two. Last week we looked at the topic of adultery, and the warnings the father gives the son concerning that issue in chapter 6. Sorry, it will occur, it will occur again at the end of chapter 6, and it will occur again in chapter 7. Here in these verses, you've got three mini-sermons. Now, if you came here for one sermon this morning, forget it. You get three times the value. Three mini-sermons rather than one long sermon. And like I say, loans, laziness, and what I've called 
the Lord's heart or things God hates. There is a pattern in the book of Proverbs and it occurs elsewhere. John in his letters likes this kind of teaching style where you take a theme and it's like a spiral staircase. You go off it and then you go round and you come back to it and you go off it and then you come back to it. All the time you're making progress, you're going up the staircase, but you're having the same theme repeated again and again. And that's what he does with this topic of adultery. Last week, and it'll come in the end of chapter 6, and it'll come up again in chapter 7. But often the themes in Proverbs come back again and again and again. A bit like that spiral staircase. So, mini-sermon number 1, verses 1 to 3. Loans, loans, verse 3. So do this, my son. Sorry, let's get the right verses. Loans, verses 1 to 3. Actually, there is a principle in this section about loans. The principle is this, do not sign papers, do not make a loan without checking out the fine print, the fine print. There is a rabbinic proverb that says, when a fool goes to the market, the merchants rejoice. When a fool goes to the market, the merchants rejoice. A little bit like our expression, a fool and his money are easily parted. And I think that's the principle in this first section. Let me divide it into two subheadings. Subheading number one, there is a warning about the debts of other people, verses one to two. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. And this warning really is guaranteeing the debts of others. Promising to pay a relative, a friend or a stranger's debts if they fail to pay. Now on first reading you might think, well that's a good thing isn't it? Helping one another out. Not always. There's an American proverb that says, before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. Before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. I, I often tell you about the television programs I like, and one of my favourites is Judge Judy. Judge Judy. You get it nowadays on the, 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 the cable channels. But Judge Judy Schneiden is, is, uh, is this reality-type courtroom. And people come before her with their cases, and Judge Judy shows the wisdom of Solomon in sorting out the mess in people's lives. And although it's fodder, it's chewing them for the eyes, I quite enjoy watching it if I flick through the channels. But there is always, the majority of cases have to do with money. And sadly, they have to do with family and friends who have lent money or require money from the other person. And Judge Judy is always saying, where is your proof? that you either borrowed the money or you promised to pay back the money. And then her favourite sayings are things like this. Did you write it down? Have you got a contract? If you have, simples. We'll sort it out. If you haven't, complicated. And that American proverb comes to mind. Which do you want the most? The money or the friendship? The money or the relationship? Because you ain't getting both when you take it to court. You can have the money and the family or the friendships destroyed. Or you keep the family and the friendship and you say goodbye to the money. It's always there. It's every other episode. Now, Bible scholars agree this is more than just someone lending a loan to a, a family member. Most scholars agree that in financial terms, it's like giving someone open credit. It's a bit like me saying, look, there's my credit card. Off you go. When you've got my credit card and PIN number, I've got no control how much you spend or where you spend it. And suddenly, in a year or six months, could come back to me a massive bill. And you still got the card and the PIN number. That's the kind of idea here in ancient times. It's offering open credit to somebody. And sooner or later, it's going to come back to bite you. There's, a, a, there's only one personal letter in the New Testament. Most letters are written to churches. 
But there's one personal letter written by the Apostle Paul to a man called Philemon. And it's a great story. And uh, the problem in in the book of uh, Philemon is this. Philemon has a slave called Onesimus who runs away and steals from him. The trouble is, as he's run away from his master and stolen from him, he encounters, I think it's the Apostle Paul, and becomes a Christian. And now he says to Paul, what do I do? If I go back, I'm going to be punished. I could be imprisoned. And in Roman times with slaves, I might even have a a, a leg amputated or a foot cut off so I can't run again. (laughs) I don't want that. What do I do? So Paul acts as a middleman. He says to Onesimus, I'll write a letter to Philemon, who's a Christian, and tell him to welcome you back. And you have a fantastic verse where he writes this. If he has wronged you, which he had done, or owes you anything, which he did do because he stole to finance his escape, Paul says, put it on my account. Put it on my account are my and can. Words that you could write above the cross of Jesus when it comes to us. He could say to God the Father, if this lot owe you anything, and we do. If they have wronged you, and they have, then charge it to me. He himself bore our sins, our wrongs, our debts in his own body on the cross. So Paul and the New Testament and the Bible is not against paying somebody's debts. The very nature of salvation is about God paying our debts. But it's not about giving open credit, liberty. So the loan here refers to guarantee someone an open life of credit, and that's a foolish thing to do. In fact, there's a play on words here on the word hand. Look at verse 1. If you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger... You shake hands to seal the deal. Then in verse 3, the word hand is again has another implication. This time, it's the, the hand has power over somebody. We use, he uses the expression, free yourself from falling into your neighbor's hand. Don't let him have a grip on you that you can't escape from. That's the idea. And then in verse 5, the, the word again. Here the word means something else. This time, it's the hand that catches and traps you. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. In other words, you are snared by the words of your own mouth if you enter into an agreement verbally and promise to pay the debts of someone else. So that's the first subheading. Here's the second one. Well, he tells us what to do if you're in that situation. Verses 3 to 5. And the answer is simple. Free yourself. Get out of the situation ASAP. Even if you have to humble yourself and grovel, throw yourself down at your neighbor's feet. Plead, 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 release me from my contract. Better to lose face than end up bankrupt like the person you agreed to help. That's the idea. So in conclusion to sermon number one on loans, We would say, don't sign papers, don't make a loan without first reading the fine print. And if you make a loan, make a contract. Make a contract. The only reason I have a house is because a very Christian lady, many years ago, gave me an interest-free loan of £30,000. I had no money to go to a bank and try and get a mortgage. But we sat down and our lawyers put a contract together. So that I didn't rip her off and leave her out of pocket and she was repaid over the years. Common sense. You make a contract. You make an agreement. You don't give someone an open credit card and say, off you go. That's the principle here. And in ancient times, they didn't have banks the same as we do and lawyers the same as we do. So you had to watch your finances carefully. So that's situation number one, loans. Situation number two is laziness. Laziness, verses 6 to 11, and those great verses, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider these ways and be wise. I've always wanted to preach on that verse, so I fulfilled my ambition here and now. Paul Roughton of uh, County Durham in England has been accused of being the laziest man in the world. In December of 2009, a cyclist reported into the authorities because of the way he saw him walking his dog. You might say, well, what's wrong with walking the dog? All the People do it all the time. 
The problem was this. He was slowly driving his Nissan Navara at five miles an hour with his hand out the window and the dog on the leash. Roten admitted it was a silly thing to do and there was an element of laziness. He pled guilty to the charge of not being in proper control of the vehicle and was banned for driving for six months and fined £66. So, Matnishis, be warned with that new dog of yours. Get out the car and walk it. Don't do this. Laziness is something we see in other people and we hate it in other people. But we kind of say, well, for me, it's all right. I've got an excuse. I've got an excuse. If only you knew my, my, my situation. We perhaps would change the word laziness when it applies to us and maybe use the word procrastination. And you know the little ditty, procrastination is my sin. It brings me naught but sorrow. I know that I should stop it. In fact, I will tomorrow. And uh, that's perhaps how laziness shows itself to you and I. We, we just put jobs off and, and why do tomorrow? We can do it next week and stuff like that. Well, in, let me give you a couple of subheadings. First of all, he gives us two examples. A positive example, verses 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Well, if you were able to listen to the children's talk earlier, three qualities I mentioned that we can learn from ants. Verse 7, ants are not lazy, they are hard workers, even when the boss or supervisor is not watching over them. You know, when I first went to, into employment at age 16, I got a job working as a painter and decorator. And our boss was a bit of a meanie. He'd never let us listen to, say, Radio 4, a talkie program. We could only listen to Radio 1, because he was convinced we painted in time to the music. So if it was Radio 1, you'd be painting like that. And if it was a talk program, you'd be listening to it, and you'd be painting slower. So we'd put whatever we want on. As soon as the car pulled up outside, quick, get Radio 1 on! And, and it changed it. Some of us change when the boss is there, don't we? That should not be the case. Ants work hard, whether they're being watched or not. Secondly, ants work together. It's teamwork. Teamwork for the good of others. Verse 8. When the work has to be done in the summer... Or in the harvest, they are busy at it. And thirdly, ants share together. It is what's best for the colony, not what's best for the individual ants. And Christianity is a bit like that. It's always collective. The church is always talk, talked about in collective terms. We are sheep in the same fold. We're bricks in a building. You know, we're, we're always together, not individual. So Solomon says to his son, watch and learn. Watch and learn from the ants. They're hard workers. And then the second example is a negative example, verses 9 to 11. And like I say, I just love verse 9. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? The Living Bible translates it, but all you do is sleep. When will you wake up? And the Good News Bible says, how long is the lazy man going to lie around? When is he ever going to get up. Later in chapter 26, verse 14, Solomon returns to this theme and he quotes one of my favourite verses of the Bible where he says, as a door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns on his bed. Isn't that fantastic poetry? As the door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns on its bed. And I have to smile because when I was a teenager... The amount of times my mother would shout up the stairs, are you up yet? And I'd be lying on my bed saying, yes, I am. And I wasn't. And then you'd have the next one. If I have to come up there, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I mean, I was 16 or 18 at this time. Yes, I'm getting up. I'm getting up. And she would just, we'd have this conversation for about 20 minutes. And I'll be honest, as a teenager, I could sleep until 1, 2 in the afternoon. No trouble at all. It was just quite natural. You got that problem, guys? Who knows? Maybe that's just growing. You know, you need to sleep because your body's growing. But uh, this is more than just being a teenager. 
Solomon has got something deeper in mind. He's asking the lazy man to explain his attitude and his actions. And the thought is this. You want to sleep, but for how long? This is excessive laziness, excessive sleep. All of us need sleep, but this is extra sleep. He's kind of saying, look, there's life to be lived and there's work to be done, and you can't get out of bed. I remember my mum said, it's a beautiful day out there, you're missing it. You know, the sun's shining, you could be doing 101 things and all you're doing is snoring in your bedroom. Or, they're waiting for you to get to work. Get up. Oh, can't have the day off. That's the idea here. It's, it's laziness in that you could be enjoying life, you could be working, but instead you're away with the fairies. And so Solomon uses the lazy person as, the, as an example to his son. Now, the Bible says that actually sleep is a reward for hard work. You work hard, you deserve your sleep. Even an afternoon nap, no problem with that if you work hard. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> Bless her. I said, I call Penny the computer because left alone for 10 minutes, she falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> verses 9 and 11 actually tells us the reward of a lazy person poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man when sluggards put off doing their work thinking to themselves oh, there's always tomorrow I'll do it later sooner or later hardship and lack of funds comes like a thief and it comes quickly when you're off guard and least expect it. So in conclusion to sermon number two on laziness, work hard, enjoy the financial rewards, work hard and enjoy the blessing of a good night's sleep or an afternoon nap. Sermon number three, the Lord's heart, verses 12 to 19, or things God hates. But for the sake of alliteration, I've chosen the Lord's heart. There's been a lot of media coverage just the last week or two about uh, England's rivers and seas and how polluted they are. Swimming in our rivers or seas has been described this way, a chemical cocktail, a chemical cocktail of sewage, agriculture and road pollution. What is supposed to be clean, pure and give pleasure to many people has turned out to be in many cases unclean, impure and a health risk. And signs are going up saying you cannot swim in this part of the sea or in this river. How sad. Well, Solomon here moves on from the lazy man in verse 6 to 11 to the impure man. The wicked man in verses 12 to 19. And he gives us a number of signs of the wicked, the impure man. Seven things that the Lord hates. That's right, hates. Seven characteristics that are contrary to the heart of God. See, every coin has two sides, heads or tails. We know the opposite to light is darkness. We know the opposite of good is evil. The opposite of love is hatred. God is love, but there are things contrary to his nature, and therefore he hates them. He hates sin. Six things are mentioned and they have their explanation in their description. So I don't have to unpack them. They explain themselves. The seventh one mentioned is the result of the other six. That's why he adds it on as a seventh. So there are six things and the seventh one is the result. What happens because of the other six? And we're told that an abomination to the Lord. The six things, let's have a quick look at them. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Verse 17, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Let's go through them very quickly. A haughty, a proud, or an arrogant look. A haughty, a proud, or an arrogant look. The idea there is you look down on other people. I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm glad I'm not like her. It's a bit like the Pharisee and the tax collector. Lord, thank you that I'm not like them. It's a superiority, a proudness. 
And God says he hates it. He hates it. Secondly is a lying tongue. Falsehoods on the tongue. That little white lie. We've all done it. And God says, uh uh-uh. I deal in truth. Don't lie. Don't lie. Thirdly, hands that shed innocent blood. The idea is someone who intentionally takes the life of another. Two hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred sixty-nine terminations of babies took place last year. That, to me, is taking the life of an innocent person. How shameful for our society! A record number of abortions took place, and they call it health care. God hates it. God hates it. Fourthly, a heart that devises evil plans. A deceptive heart is another way to translate that verse. It's the idea of being a con man, the Arthur Daly, the Dell boy. You get rich at somebody else's expense. Today we would say scammers. Hello, this is from Windows in India. You've got a problem with your computer. If you give me your credit card, I'll sort it out for you. Scammers. People who come to your door and want to sell you stuff when they're scamming you all the time. God says, I hate it. People who are deceptive. A heart that devises evil plans. He goes on to say, feet that are swift into running to evil. Feet that are swift into running to evil. You see, a whole person's being is guided by your feet. You go where your feet take you. And swift, you go fast. He's saying, someone who goes fast to commit sin. They can't get there quick enough. That's the idea. A person who wants to inflict harm or evil on someone else, and they do it quickly. God hates it. God hates it. A false witness who speaks lies. Now, that's different from a liar's tongue. They're similar, but there's a difference. This particular lie is committed with the intention you're lying to harm someone. It's not a little white lie. You're deliberately lying to cause harm to somebody else. And again, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Do not bear false witness. And you know it's wrong to lie about people because you know how you feel when people lie against you. And then the last one. One who sows discord among the brethren. If you sow discord, you're creating a rift between individuals. You create, you, you create a climate, climate of distrust, fear, and suspicion in the hearts of others around you. And God hates that. God hates that. So in conclusion to my third sermon this morning, or my third mini-sermon, the collection of seven sins is focused on how we treat other people. See, you love God and you love your neighbour as yourself. has a knock-on effect. And if you're not treating your neighbour as yourself, you don't really love God. The two go hand in glove. And God is concerned how we treat others. And these are serious sins. God hates haughty eyes. Value others. Don't look down on them. God hates the lying tongue, so tell the truth. God hates shedding of innocent blood. Value life. God hates uh, the divisive plans of evil people. God hates feet that run to evil. God hates false witness. And God hates those who show di- or, or, or sow discord. Seek unity. Let's pray. Lord, your word often scratches where we itch. And we pray this morning as you have spoke to us, help us to think these things through. And apply it to our hearts and minds, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's conclude with our final hymn, shall we? Do stay for refreshments. Don't feel you need to rush off. But I like this little chorus. Living under the shadow of his wing, we find security. As we stand in his presence, as we worship the Lord in spirit and truth, we can know his power in our lives to overcome these negative traits with those which are positive. Just down. Living on.
under the shadow of his wing we find security standing in his presence we will bring our worship 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 to Bowed in adoration at his feet, we dwell in harmony. Voices join together that repeat. Worthy, worthy. to heart embracing in his love reveals his purity soaring in my spirit like a dove holy Uh, conclude with a short prayer eh? to the king of ages immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen amen, amen. do stay for refreshments enjoy your day